So I was reading in one of my commentaries this week, and it said, uh, this is about the passage in Mark we're in today. It says, you know, if you want to build a big crowd for a Sunday morning service, you, you, you publicize that you're going to be preaching on sex, right? And when the church preaches on sex, the, the, the congregation swells. So you're like, oh my goodness, they're going to talk about sex. Let's, let's hear what this is all about. And, you know, and another way to build a, a, a big church service is to preach on heaven, right? Because people want to know, like, what is the future going to be like for those of us who trust Jesus. And he says, if you want to build an epically large crowd, you preach on this passage here, which is about sex in heaven, okay? So, so today, we're going to be talking uh, about what that looks like, okay? And it won't be uh, graphic if your children are still here, I promise you, it's, it's PG at worst. But, um, but, it, but if you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 12, and we're going to pick up in verse 18, okay? So that's where we're going to start. Mark is the second book in the New Testament, Matthew, then Mark, followed by Luke and John. Uh, we're in chapter 12, starting in verse 18. And you remember what's going on. Jesus has, has done uh, three years of ministry. He's in the last week of his life. We know this because we've read ahead. Um, but he's in the last week of his life. He's in Jerusalem, and he's teaching uh, in the temple grounds. And so he's just fended off an attack uh, by the Herodians and the Pharisees. Um, and now uh, he's dealing with the second group of religious leaders who want to attack him. And we pick up in verse 18, and it says, And the Sadducees came to him. And I'm going to stop there just real quick to uh, uh, kind of get your minds around this. The Sadducees were the, uh, the other ruling party in, in ancient uh, Jewish life. So you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which were kind of like religious elites. Uh, they were the people who followed God's law most closely. Um, but they had some very different interpretations about different passages in Scripture, and so they were on separate sides. If the Herodians were kind of a side thing, um, they were kind of just a political power group in there. So this is a very important group of people, these Sadducees. And they came to him, <clears throat> uh, and these are the people who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow... And raise up offspring for his brother. So there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife. And when he died, he left no offspring. And the second one took her, and he died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, uh, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven each had her as a wife. And Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Okay, so the story begins, and Jesus is in the temple area. He's just beaten off. Uh, some of the smartest people uh, with their gotcha question, and he deals with gotcha question number two. We all like gotcha questions, right? We like to phrase questions in a way that makes the other side look stupid, right? Whatever it is, whether it's, it's politics or just an argument that you're having with someone, you try to find a weakness in their, in their thought process, and then you play it out in front of them, and you're like, here's your argument. Look how stupid it is. And so they're coming to Jesus to talk about the resurrection, now, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, right? They have no, they don't, they, they believe that when you die, you go down into a place called Sheol, which is the grave, and you remain there forever. That, that this life on this side is all that there is, and you live your life for the future through your children, not for some future resurrection, heaven, hell, whatever you want to picture there. It's just kind of this is all that there is. And this was the major dividing line between them and the Pharisees. Right? That's why when Jesus describes them as Sadducees, he says these are the people who believe there was no resurrection. Right? And, and Bob Wilson uh, said, and I've said before, right, you know, the, the, we, how do we know what the Sadducees are? Right? They're sad, you see, because they don't think there's a heaven. Right? So, so there you go. That's, that's, that's the Sadducees, right? They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. So these people believe this life is all there is. But they come to Jesus to pick on his argument. Like, we know you believe in a resurrection, Jesus, so we're going to give you this, this case. And it's uncrackable, it's unsolvable, because here's what happens. You have this woman, and she's married to this guy, and he has six other brothers, right? And so he's one of seven brothers, 
uh, and they get married, and they don't have any children. And this seems weird, like, why would that matter? But in the Old Testament, and back in the, in the good old days, right, property rights were passed on through the, through the male side of the family. And so it was a big deal that if you, were a, if you were a man, if you had a son, you could pass your property on to them. And so if you're one of seven sons, it would be important to pass your property on to your kids. And so there was a, a, a kind of like a law or provision called Leverite marriage. And you would marry, if you died and didn't have a son, your brother would marry your wife, father a child with your wife. Now, this seems all kind of weird, I agree. Right? Father a child with your wife. And then that boy, whoever he is, you know, boy X, would be the dead child's son, right? The dead husband's son. And so when the property gets transferred, it goes to little Johnny instead of getting divided up into the pile above there. There's a really kind of graphic story in the book of Genesis about Judah's children, right? And Judah has this issue with his kids, Ur and Onan. Uh, My wife doesn't want me to share this story. But if you want to read it, uh, just read the story about uh, Judah's kids and Tamar. Uh, But but, uh, what happens in that story basically is one of his sons um, dies, and then his other sons refuse to do this thing here to make make a child. Um, for him, and God kills those kids, right? Now, that's kind of the way that story goes. So you can read it later. Uh, it's a fun story. It's a bedtime story for kids, okay? Just sit down with your kids <laughs> and read it uh, at night. It'll also open up other conversations that you should probably have with your kids anyways, right? So, so it's a good little bridge uh, to other stories about birds and bees and whatnot. Okay, so, um, so they ask Jesus this question, saying he's got this woman. She, she marries a guy. And then he dies, and she doesn't have any kids, and so she marries the second brother, because she's supposed to, and he dies, and the third dies, and the fourth dies, and the fifth dies. Somewhere along the way, you recognize, like, she's bad luck, right? I mean, like, if five of your brothers have died, and you're the sixth one in line, you're like, I don't know about this lady. (laughs) I don't know about this lady right now, right? But all seven of these brothers um, go through the process, all seven of them die, uh, and then you have this woman, and she dies, and the gotcha question is, like, whose wife is she when, when they all come back, right? Because, they, they, you know, the only way they understood the resurrection was, like, it was going to be exactly kind of like this, an extension of this, and so she has to belong to somebody. She's got to be somebody's wife, and maybe, you know, maybe she'd be the first husband's wife because, you know, he staked the claim first, or maybe he'd be the last husband's wife because he was the husband of record most recently. Um, but, but she's got to belong to somebody. This is an interesting phrase, right? She has to belong to somebody, right? It's very, very anti-feminist to say it like that. But you know what's wonderful about Jesus? Like, it it's really is neat. We miss it sometimes. But Jesus wasn't totally caught up in, like, the cultural issues of the day. That's why when Jesus says something that, that, that's countercultural uh, to our day, we need to recognize he wasn't just, just trapped, right? Like, they believe that the, the man had possession of the wife. Like, she was property for them. Whose husband will get her. Who, who's going to have her in the resurrection? And Jesus says, yeah, that's not really how it is. Right? She doesn't belong to any of these men. She's not property of these men. She's a sovereign individual person. And in the resurrection, things are going to be different. This is the first thing we need to know about heaven, right? And, and I've mentioned heaven before. We have a really kind of like bad picture of heaven uh, because all of our ideas of heaven come from all dogs go to heaven. I think that's really the totality of our knowledge of heaven goes from, from, from some terrible movie um, that's really pretty dark, really, if you want to get into it. But, 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 but you know, it's, it's harps and it's clouds and it's, uh, you know, you go up there. and We don't even know what we do up there, but we're up there somehow. And uh, now we all like to play the harp. It's weird, right? Heaven doesn't sound that fun. If you want to, like my honest opinion, the all dogs go to heaven doesn't sound that good. All right, and so uh, Jesus begins to teach us a little bit about heaven, and every time I learn about heaven from Scripture, I find out we have a really bad understanding. Right? We have a bad understanding. Heaven is different than what you think it's going to be. Eternity is different than what you think. And now the book of Revelation helps to flesh that out. If you want to have a good biblical understanding of what eternity looks like um, for, the, for those who trust Christ and know Jesus Christ, read Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Right, that right there will give you a, a, the, the best foundational understanding of heaven, and it will change your mind about what it looks like. It's not, you know, going and being up. I don't know why up either, but it's not being up, right? It's, it's being on this new heaven, new earth, this place that God has made for us to be. 
right? And when we get to experience things, but it's different. And so Jesus looks at the Sadducees and says, you guys think heaven's going to be like this. You, you, you think eternity's going to be like this, or you don't really think that, but you're saying eternity's going to be exactly like it is here. And Jesus is saying, I'm saying you've got it all wrong. It's totally different. Now, eternity is a different beast, right? There's not going to be marriage in heaven. And this is tough on me because I like being married, right? My wife and I celebrated our 18th anniversary uh, last Sunday. This week, we went off to Dallas and had like a three-day trip up there, all expense paid, thanks to my brother, wonderful guy. Thank you, Lewis. Appreciate you. Um, but, uh, you know, like we had, we had a wonderful trip, stayed in some swanky hotel, like it was weird, like I'll tell you about it later. But, right, like uh, we stayed in this nice hotel, and like it was really, really a great time. I love being married, right? I got married when I was 19 years old because I wanted to be married. And, and if God gives me long life and my wife puts up with me uh, through her long life, like I, I look forward to hitting some of those. Now, I hear some of y'all hit like 60s and 70th anniversaries. Like, like those numbers were in play for me because I got married so freakishly young. Right? Like, so I'm, I'm excited about what, what this long life with my wife could look like. And then when Jesus says heaven doesn't have marriage, like my heart hurts. I'm like, some of y'all are like, praise the Lord, right? Like, like I've only got to serve, serve 45 years. I had a, it's one of my, one of my favorite stories. There was a, a lady who went to church here, and, you know, uh, her, Jack was here teaching, and he was preaching this pastor before me, and uh, he was teaching about something, and marriage is forever and for life, and they'd been over, and they said, well, I, I know marriage is forever, I just didn't know he was going to live this long, right? <laughs> like, the idea of, like, yeah, I know marriage is forever, but boy, some, sometimes it seems like a sentence, as opposed to a blessing, <laughs> that it's forever, Right, so, but, but I mean, like, like, I love being married. And so for me, like, eternity, thinking of eternity without, like, marriage, like, what marriage is, not just uh, the physical act of marriage, but, like, just being whatever marriage is inside the soul of me and inside of myself, like, it, it hurts sometimes to think about. It, right, it makes me sad to think, like, man, I'm not going to have that. I'm not going to be able to possess that for. For all time like there's a part of me that mourns for that and then there's another part of me that says you know what if god says like that that you're going to have eternity and it's going to be this tremendous blessed life and god says but there's not going to be giving a marriage and taking a marriage and all this stuff you're gonna be like the angels like god has a better understanding of what i what i need right and so like like this thing that i do where, where i'm married and i enjoy marriage right and it, and it gives me some of the greatest joy of my life is being married Right? God says that is just like a whisper towards what God has. Right? Like it, it, it doesn't even measure on the goodness and greatness that God has. That doesn't mean that when I get to heaven, I won't know who my wife is, or we won't have some sort of shared life experience, and maybe she'll live in the condo down the hall. I don't really know how all that's going to work out. But I do know this. When God says there's not going to be a giving and taking in marriage, and that each of us gets to heaven on our own merits, and that we get to experience God in a unique and good way, like the fact that the best thing that I have on earth, God says, it's not good enough for heaven, kind of makes me excited. Right? Like if, if the best thing that I have on this side of eternity, God says, yeah, that's not good enough. I've got something better. Right? I'm going to enjoy it on this side. I'm going to love my wife on this side. I do love you, baby. You are tremendous. Right? I'm going to love everything that I have on this side, but I kind of look forward if, if the best thing on this side, God says, yeah, that's not quite good enough on the other side. That's, that's tremendous, guys. We should be excited. And, and, and so, like, my, my idea of playing a harp all day in heaven, like, I'm like, that's not better. Right? That's not better than, 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 than going on a vacation with my wife. And so, like, harp playing for me is out. Maybe you get really excited about playing the harp. Right? God bless you. Maybe, maybe some of you are going to be professional harp players up there. Right? But, but, but for me, I don't see that being the case. Right, because, because something better than the best thing that I experience is what I'm going to experience in eternity. Eternity is a tremendously blessed place. And it's, it's impossible for our minds to get it. Right? Like we, we, and I love that Jesus tells us this because it tells us, like, guys, it's, it's better. Like, it's better than what you think. Like when we talk, and I, and I do funerals too often, and I talk about, you know, grandma's going on, or mama's going on, and, and, and there has been some wonderful faithful people that I've been able to eulogize, and I've been able to, to talk about how God has been faithful. You know what they're experiencing here? And I say, man, it's better than anything we can imagine. 
I don't think people get that, though. It's literally better than anything you can imagine. Like, take the best thing, you know, take the Fortnite win where you just use the pickaxe the whole way through, DOS. Right? It's better than that. Right? That'd be a good win, right? DOS? Would that be a good win? That'd be a good win. So, <laughs> right? Right? It's better than, 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 than you know, the, pitching a perfect game in baseball. Right? It, it's better than whatever your highlight moment in your life is going to be. God's like, yeah, that, that's not good enough for real eternity for you. And that means we, we're going to experience some stuff that I can't tell you about. All I can tell you is, guys, what you think heaven is, you're wrong. It's better. And now, now you're thinking of something better, you're wrong. It's still better. Right? And now, as you're like, man, my mind is just blowing, it's still better. Guys, it's better than we can hope or imagine, or think about, it breaks our brains to recognize the goodness of God as he's going to pour it out to us. Marriage isn't going to be a part of heaven. Oh my goodness, it hurts my heart. But then I think, like, if that's not good enough, how good is heaven going to be? How good is this new earth that God is going to place us on going to be? That's the first point Jesus wants to make with the Sadducees. Guys, heaven, this resurrected life, it's different than you think, and it's better than you can imagine. But the second thing, and it's very, very important you get the second thing, guys. It's not just different and better. It's literally real. It's, it's real. It's not some concept. It's not some like hook out there of like some future thing that may or may not come true. It's absolutely with certainty real. So Jesus is dealing with people who doubt uh, the, 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 the nature of the eternality of the soul. He's dealing with people who doubt the resurrection. And he's like, guys, it's real. Not only is it different than you think, not only is it better than you can imagine, not only is it tremendous beyond words can express, it's absolutely real. Guys, in the reality of eternity should sit with the believer every day of their life. That this life, you know, the 80 years or 90 years that we get on this ball of earth, right, it seems like a big deal, and it is a big deal. Your choices here matter. Like, they have real value. When you sit down and you read um, Bible stories to your children when they're small, it matters. Right? When you share your faith with your coworker, it matters. When you're kind to someone who's been rude to you, it matters. Those, those little decisions matter because they have an eternal impact on someone else's eternal soul. Right? So, so there's big things about this life here. But guys, this life is not all there is. And so if you live your life fully for the years here, you are going to be devastated on the other side. I mean devastated. The, the, the book of Corinthians, Paul talks about um, God tests all of our works. He tests everything that we've done, good, bad, and indifferent. And he tests them in fire. And the idea is like everything of your life is put into the fire. So so your job, your your, your family, uh, those you've loved, those you've hated, everything is put into the fire. And God burns away everything that's worthless. And at the end, what's left is what's precious. And some of us, we're going to go in with a big old pile of two tons of stuff And we're going to put it in the fire, and when we get it back out, we're going to have ashes left. Because we put nothing in the fire that will last. Like We've lived for this world and this life, and we've not lived for the life to come, and there will be grief on that day. It's tough to imagine grief in a perfect place. Like My mind, again, it hurts, guys. There's going to be grief when we recognize that everything that we did, what comes back is just just a handful of precious things. And some of us, we may not even have a handful of precious things. Guys, live your life with the future in mind and not the future of your 401k. I mean, have that in mind too, guys. I don't want you to be destitute. but, But like, live your life beyond this world. There are real things happening beyond this world. There are real uh, real life choices that, that, that you're making now that will affect eternity for yourself and for others. Heaven is a real place. Eternity is a real thing. The Sadducees didn't believe it. 
Right? So Jesus says, you remember, Moses went to the bush, and the bush says, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He didn't say, I, I was the God of Abraham, and I was the God of Isaac, and I was the God of Jacob, but now I'm going to be your God. No, he's like, I'm the God of these people because they trusted me, and they're still living now. I'm still Abraham's God. Yes, he's been dead for, I don't know, roughly 250 years, and and I'm still Isaac's God, and I'm still Jacob's God. I'm still these guys' gods who have been dead for, for, for centuries because they're not really dead. They're still mine. Guys, eternity is a real thing, and that means that we need to prepare ourselves for that. The first thing to prepare ourselves for eternity is to align ourselves on the right side of eternity, right? And I, I divide our church into the sheep and the goats. Sometimes people tell me I should divide them into the sheep and the goats, but my, my mind doesn't work that way. So I'm sorry, goats, you're over here, okay? Right? And there's a sifting that takes place, right? And God walks through all of mankind, and he, and he writes down the names of everyone in mankind who gets to sit on the sheep side. That's the side you want to be on, by the way, not in here, but in, in eternity, you want to be identified as one of the sheep of God. And the way you get on that is you get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's literally a gigantic book uh, that God writes down the names. And the way you get your name written there, right? the way you get your name written there, it isn't by giving checks to this church. We'll take them, I promise. But that's not how you get your name written there. It isn't by being nice to old ladies. You should be nice to old ladies. And if you're an old lady... You should be nice to your peers, okay? So be nice to each other, right? Right, like you should be nice to old ladies. You should, you should help people. You should be kind. You should be generous, right? All the things that make people a Boy Scout, you should do. But those things don't move you from goat to sheep, right? The only thing that moves you over, the only way you get your name written in the book of life where you get to experience eternity that is unexplainably great, the only way you get there is by trusting in Jesus Christ. To recognize that everything that you do, every good work that you've done, every, every choice that you've made, every life decision that you've gone through has led you further away from God ultimately. And the only way for you to experience grace and forgiveness is to say, God, I can't do it on my own. Guys, I've, I've shared before, I lived... Uh, I got baptized when I was like eight years old, um, and so I lived from eight to 15 really trying hard to be a good person. I mean, and I gave up at 15, I guess, but, but I mean, I really tried hard to be a good person. I was, I was nice to people. I was generally pretty respectful. Um, I went to church. I was a, a leader in my youth group. Um, I tried, uh, you know, to, to, to avoid most of the bad things. You know, you win some, lose some, right? But I tried to be a good person. And I ran on that treadmill. And that treadmill is if you're good enough, if you run fast enough and hard enough, you can get to God because you can be good enough to get there. But you know the problem with the treadmill is? Like, no matter how fast you run, like, like it just keeps speeding up. And then you have to keep going at that speed or you fall off the treadmill. And at 15, I fell off the treadmill. I couldn't keep up anymore. I was exhausted. And I remember I was sitting like about where my wife was, roughly maybe one more row further back. It was Sunday night church, and some guy came up and said, you can't be good enough for God. But if you will trust Jesus Christ, he's good enough for you. And what that means is if you'll trust that Jesus died for your sins, that means he took the punishment that you deserve, if you'll trust that, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, and you'll surrender your life to, to living for him, if you'll do that, then guess what? He has already done the work to get you there. And I remember I was 15, I fell off the treadmill, I started crying. 15 years old, I don't, I don't cry now, I'm, I mean, uh, really. It's not part of who I am. It's very difficult to make me cry. Onions, maybe. I don't know. Um, I just don't cry. I'm, I'm not geared that way. I'm not, I, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a guy in here and you cry, God bless you. Your, your family is better because of it, I promise. Um, but it's just not who I am. I was 15. I was sitting with my girlfriend. And, uh, and I was sitting there, and, and, I, and just God spoke to me. He said, man, you can't do this. But I've already done it. And a guy got down, like, I'm going to get down here in a minute. And he said, look, if you want to trust Jesus Christ, 
and you want to you want to you want to surrender your life to Jesus and let Jesus take the punishment for your sin and then you want to live your life trying to be pleasing to him live your life for his purposes going forward come down to me and I mean as soon as the song started and I'm right there right I was up there Right, my parents were confused because I was baptized when I was eight years old. Right, I went through the tub, I answered all the questions, I looked like a pretty good person, but I wasn't. I didn't have it, guys. I didn't have it all figured out. I was 15 years old, God spoke to me and said, Matt, today's the day. Come home. You've been running. And you're tired. It's time to come home. Some of you may have been running for a long time. Some of you may have been just trying really hard every day. Man, I'm going to be good enough, I'm going to be good enough. But you're not. I said last week, I'll say it again, you can't fix you, you're the problem. Come home. God doesn't wish that anyone would perish and, and experience separation. You know, I talked a lot about heaven, about how great it is and how wonderful it is. But you know, there, there's, there's an opposite end to that spectrum, right? There's eternity in, in the hearts for all mankind. And that means some of us will go to a place that is just as heaven is unexplainably, tremendously amazing. Like there's another place called hell, that is the exact opposite of that. Tremendously, unexplainably terrible. And I don't wish that for anyone that ever hears my voice. God desires to call you home. And he desires to give you better than the best things on this side. Will you come home today? Guys, heaven is a real place. It's different than we think. And it's prepared for those people who trust Jesus Christ. Will you trust him? today and if you've already trusted him today will you live your life today with the knowledge that other people's eternity hang in the balance based on how you behave to them let's pray